Hi, everyone. I'm Bob Kastenchak, and I'm a taxonomist. I'm also Senior Manager for Client Solutions at Synaptica. I'm glad to be here at Virtual Taxonomy Bootcamp. Uh, like everyone else, I look forward to seeing you all in person when we can finally resume physical meetings. But for now, we're going to do this virtually. So very briefly, Synaptica is a leading taxonomy and ontology software and consulting company. Be sure to visit our booth in the virtual exhibit hall during the conference to chat or get more information. My talk today is on mapping taxonomies. This is not a new topic, but I think that we're seeing increasing interest in mapping recently as organizations develop more complex e information ecosystems like graphs and ontologies and are looking for help with mapping techniques and strategies. As businesses develop new information services or information units or acquire other companies with existing technologies or seek to integrate various in-house vocabulary systems, or connect their internal vocabularies to external sources for linked data and other uses, mapping between vocabularies is becoming a common task. The goal of this talk is to provide an overview of topics related to mapping vocabularies and some things to consider when approaching problems in this space. So what do we mean when we say we're mapping vocabularies? Unless we mean we're going to assert, uh, sorry, usually we mean we're going to assert some kind of relationship between terms and distinct taxonomies either of equivalence to say that two or more terms are describing the same or nearly the same concept. However, some maps assert other kinds of relationships, like a relationship between diseases and drugs that treat them or symptoms that describe them. This is getting pretty close to describing ontological structures, which I'll talk some more about later. Mapping can connect vocabularies in a domain or with overlapping domains or connect vocabularies across domains. So two vocabularies describing topics in, say, astronomy might have lots of concepts in common that can be linked with equivalency relationships. In another case, a taxonomy in physics could be linked to an astronomy vocabulary that has terms in common, but the astronomy uh, vocabulary is probably far more granular in the realm of astronomy than in the physics vocabulary. Another reason to map is to crosswalk taxonomies. Perhaps you have two content sets tagged with terms from separate taxonomies and they need to be available in the same search and discovery interface, or a shallow navigation taxonomy used for display that's crosswalked to a much more detailed product vocabulary on the back end in an e-commerce or e-retail situation. In the simplest case I described, connecting similar concepts in two distinct taxonomies, the mapping is one of equivalency. However, this doesn't mean terms from an entire taxonomy will, will map one to one with another as they may be structured differently. Here I have a screenshot of a project with two common large vocabularies, GEMIT, the General Multilingual Environmental Thesaurus, and UNESCO, the United Nations Education, Scientific, and Cultural Organization's Large General Topic Vocabulary. Both vocabularies contain a term agriculture, shown here in GEMIT and here in UNESCO. In the simplest terms, I can cre create an equivalency relationship. In this case, I'm just going to use an existing SCOS relationship ex asserting this equivalence and apply it. Just like any related term, this relationship is bidirectional. It applies to both terms. Here you can see that the two terms agriculture, represented here with their closest hierarchical relationships and connected by this line in the middle, uh, are in, uh, and the vocabularies are in different colors. That's gamut in blue on the right and UNESCO in the grayish on the left. Uh, and I've established a, an equivalency relationship between agriculture in both taxonomies. It is not the case, though, that all of their narrower terms, for example, will also map to another in a simple one-to-one -one fashion. In fact, mapping multiple terms between GAMET and UNESCO proves to be quite complex, as the way each the source is organized, that is to say, what are considered subtopics or children terms, is quite different. In this graphic, the link in the center on the right between the terms agricultural economics, uh, each of those terms link to entirely different areas of each vocabulary. And the link for economics, which you can see in the center bottom, of the picture is divorced from the mapped area. This is just an example to introduce the idea that maps aren't always, or even usually, tidy. I covered many of the reasons to pursue mapping earlier. Again, the simplest case is resolving taxonomies on the same or overlapping topics or across topics. Drugs, diseases, and treatments is an easy to grasp example of this. 
Other sorts of common mappings are organizational to topical taxonomies, which department has content on which topics and controls it, for example, or to resolve tagging sets or content sets with indexing from different taxonomies. This is important, for example, when trying to offer a single search for disparately tagged content, which uh, is a pretty common situation in large organizations. Connecting taxonomies in this way, especially to map across topics like drugs and diseases, for example, where the relation isn't necessarily something like same as, but more like drug treats disease, is getting pretty close to merging taxonomies into an ontology. To complete this process, the map must be expressed in a machine understandable relationship, and preferably one that is commonly used out in the ontology world, and I'll talk about these relationships more in a little bit. Finally, a word about linked data. There are a great many open linked data sets available out there, and mapping your taxonomy to concepts in, say, Wikidata or DBpedia allows you to assert a relationship to a stable concept object in the greater semantic web. This is extraordinarily useful and probably the subject of an entire separate talk, but not today. For now, I'll note that one of the benefits of undertaking a linked data mapping is that once the link is established, you can pull additional information directly into your own vocabulary, like definitions, synonyms, and a host of other data. This can be very useful when ramping up your vocabulary for additional business cases and making open data sets available. And many taxonomy and ontology tools now support linked data directly in the UI. Essentially, any RDF ontology uh, can be built on linked data principles anyway, so extending this is both logical and beneficial. Here's a nice visualization I found, a uh, reference at the bottom, of the connection between some medical concept type vocabularies with specified relationships, symptoms and diseases and anatomy and so forth. Expressed in RDF, this is absolutely an example of connecting conceptual terminology sets to form an ontology. And further, although this could be another talk uh, in its entirety, is a great way to expand your vocabulary program towards ontologies. As soon as we get into the realm of mapping more than two vocabularies, we encounter the question of how to design the system of mappings between them. As we saw in the previous slide, this can be pretty intimidating, but even when simply dealing with term level equivalence mapping, we need to consider some options. This is very similar to thinking about systems integration in a complex information ecosystem. So let's start with a simpler case and then we'll move to something more complicated. I borrowed this image from Heather Hedden's blog post on taxonomy mapping from last year, which you can find at the URL I've provided below, to show that even mapping between two simple hierarchies will expose problems, one to many relationships in both directions and unmapped nodes, for example. Further, as I showed in my initial example about UNESCO and GAMET, and as is illustrated here, uh, children of map terms may not map themselves. The topical structure of two vocabularies might be substantially different based on their point of view. However, identifying such disparities and unmapped nodes is a nice way to approach a potential gap analysis. So if you can capture this information when you make a map, that is to say which nodes went unmapped or have one to many or many to one relationships, that can be very useful for future uh, vocabulary development. Mapping multiple vocabularies, as mentioned, brings up the concept of different mapping models. Here's a diagram explaining two of the more common models. I have borrowed this image and con concept from transportation logistics. That point-to-point -point mapping, every vocabulary maps to every other vocabulary, provides direct mappings for everything but is messy and complicated, like the diagram on the left. So if you have a network of train stations and every station maps to every other station, you're left with something that's very detailed and lets you get from point to point, but it's a big mess and requires lots and lots of lines. Um, this speech should be familiar from linked data principles. The hub and spoke model on the right, one vocabulary serves as a central mapping point to all of the others. Uh, this can be a better fit in many information ecosystems, provided that the hub is large enough to map to all the other vocabularies. Both of these, I think, are preferable to a chained model where taxonomy A maps, maps to taxonomy B, maps to taxonomy C, and so forth, as there can be a loss of fidelity, uh, that is, there's noise in the signal in the map as you go across. So uh, as you travel the chain, the fidelity gets lower. So what seemed like a very, very close equivalence from A to B and B to C and C to D has degraded when A is compared to the mapped, 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 mapped term over in D. Consider this example, terms map to one another that make sense locally, A is very close to B, B is very close to C, C is very close to D, but when you go from A to D, you've lost some fidelity in the equivalency. So this makes more sense um, in a hub and spoke model. Now, this assumes equivalency mappings, uh, but this simple model I think makes more sense.
if we use a hub and spoke model instead, uh, and it makes even more sense if we introduce some other kinds of relationships, again, moving towards ontology, um, to specify the relationship between these things instead of just drawing lines between them. Scott's broad match is more like a BT, where economics isn't asserted as an equivalent to these terms, but as a broader term, even though these terms all live in different vocabularies. In fact, this uh, makes it pretty easy to ease into the topic of mapping relationships uh, by labeling these edges using instead of equate a straight equivalency SCOS broad match. Uh, so uh, just in SCOS, there are too many mapping properties to list on a slide, and additional relationships for mapping useful for mapping can be found in OWL, Dublin Core, Schema.org, and other ontologies. But here you can see that just in SCOS, there's same as, which sounds like exactly what it is, close match, which is not quite same as, uh, things like has broad and narrow match, which are essentially external BTs and NTs, uh, related match was ex external RTs, and uh, several others as well. Um, uh, additionally, spe specific relations like the one shown in the drugs, treatments, diseases diagram that I showed previously are widely available and used. Lastly, you can always declare a new relationship to fit your own purposes uh, anytime you want if you declare a namespace, although I strongly encourage you to do a little research and see if there's a relationship out in the world you can appropriate first as it's better practices for semantic web vocabulary linking. Uh, and once again, I'll note that we're basically talking about ontologies at this point. Broadly speaking, there are two basic ways of accomplishing mapping between vocabularies. Manual mapping involves, well, mapping by hand. Someone goes through each vocabulary and finds equivalencies or other types of matches uh, and asserts a link. Preferably, this can be done directly in a vocabulary tool, but all too often it's done in spreadsheets, which can be fine and useful, but a stable machine readable map is far better, better and I'll talk about that a little more in a second. On the other side of the coin is automated matching of various types, which is accomplished by machine based on one or more natural language processing techniques, a few of which I have listed here. Uh, string matches look for exact terms, economics, economics, words in common uh, are terms that don't match exactly, but have one or more words in common. Fuzzy matches uses Levenstein distances and other NLP principles to find things that look like each other and maybe the same. And you can also look around the hierarchy at broader and narrower terms and other properties to see if you can find potential matches and equivalences or other relationships. Um, any automated matching, I, I, I will caution, should be treated as suggested mappings and will require curation and review. There's just too much ambiguity in language to do an automated mapping and call it at that. So even automated mapping is going to require manual curation. Words out of context are just too ambiguous for machines to map accurately without any intervention. Um, among the common types of automated matching, as I described, are exact matches uh, and contains matches where uh, one term is contained entirely in another term. Fuzzy matches uh, where the text strings are either stemmed or have other uh, similarities in common. Uh, like lots of letters uh, or beginning letters um, and other kinds of lexical variants. Uh, these can be broad and messy and create noisy suggested matches, but they're useful for rooting out potential matches that you can review. Um, it's also interesting to explore, explore leveraging other data elements uh, like text in fields like scope notes, non-preferred terms, and other attributes associated with concepts in one or both vocabularies as potential text elements as fodder for natural language processing to suggest possible matches or to boost a confidence rating of potential matches. It may sound like these are long shots or not useful, but when mapping very, very large vocabularies, any potential match is useful as a suggestion. Lastly, I'd like to talk about uh, I'd like to talk about some tools for mapping. For better or for worse, lots of mapping is still done in Excel. Importing two or more vocabularies to compare and add a mapping relationship between them is extremely common. And I'll add, there's nothing wrong with this as a means to an end. Using Excel as a tool where you can manipulate data, even text data, is uh, is is very useful. But when you're done, you want to be able to import an Excel sheet of mapped vocabularies into a system that can ingest and leverage the map that you've made in a machine understandable way. That is to say, Excel is a great mapping tool, but not an ideal place to store your map because it's not leverageable by other systems. 
Now, as I described earlier, uh, many vocabulary management tools these days have mapping, uh, mapping utilities built into them. At Synaptica, since this is what I'm allowed to use and show, uh, in our system KMS, you can select two vocabularies and then some options for text string matching. And they go from strict to fuzzy, exact match, keywords match, sound X, which is a fuzzy kind of match, multiple word and single word smart search, which includes uh, kinds of stemming, select which kinds of matches you'd like to see. Uh, and you can do this iteratively if you like. And then review the suggested mappings. So here are some mappings that are exact, some mappings that are close, some mappings that have words contained in other terms. And then you can select them or delete them out of the list if you don't like that suggested map. Uh, when you're uh, finished, you can automatically apply a specified relationship to both sets of terms and vocabularies, and then the map is stored in the system as a, uh, as a, as a relationship between the two vocabularies that you can leverage in a machine-readable way. Now, there's also a lot of similar work done outside of taxonomy tools using natural language processing techniques in programming languages, particularly, but not exclusively, Python, and including other languages as well. Which uh, Python is expressly well suited to natural language processing. Um, this kind of activity usually involves collaborating with a programmer. You have a mapping problem to solve. You go to a programmer who has time to help you. You describe your problem. He ingests your files and writes a routine to try and do some kinds of mappings um, for you. So being able to describe your exact requirements uh, is is to the programmers important. So knowing a little about regular expressions and natural language processing techniques might be helpful. Uh, so if you familiar yourself with the vocabularies that you're trying to map first and maybe do some sample mapping by hand in order to clearly explain what you're looking for when you're trying to match text strings programmatically, it'll be, help. it'll be helpful. The benefit of this approach is flexibility. Basically, any kind of text matching you can imagine can be coded and executed. And I'll also caution that this process is iterative, and it may take several attempts to get it right. Finally, as a sort of uh, topic in the tool section, it's important to note that for many commonly used vocabularies, there are existing maps that you can acquire, maps and crosswalks that exist out in the world. Some may need to be licensed or purchased, and some need to be hunted down. But it's a good practice to do some research to see if existing maps exist between uh, common vocabularies. You can save yourself quite a bit of time. For in the, in the medical space, for example, there are crosswalks between the major code sets like ICT-10, CPT, and HICSPIX, as well as to commonly used medical vocabularies like MeSH and SNOMED that you can uh, find on the web. Sometimes you have to buy or license them, like I said, ingest them into your system and get a real jump start on, on the mapping work that you're trying to do. Because these can be extremely large vocabularies and remapping them by hand would be a significant effort. So be sure to do your due diligence and homework. Thanks, that's all I have for my mapping talk today. I'll stick around for questions after the session and I'll also be available at the Synaptica booth during virtual exhibit hours during the rest of the conference.